Today I'd like to tell you a little bit about the vision that, um, that's driving what we're trying to do. And this is very much a vision talk because we're a very young enterprise, so we don't quite have data to show about what we're doing, but I'd like to tell you about why we think it's important. So I'm going to start with a very brief preview of machine learning, which is probably unnecessary for this audience, but I think it leads nicely into some of the stuff that I'll talk about later. So I think we all know about the progress that's happened in machine learning just in the last few years, um, literally from uh, 2010 onwards, where back in 2005, if we were to ask the simple binary classification, is there a bear in this image? Yes, no, we'd get it better, maybe we'd get it slightly better than random. 2012, multi-class classification, the days of ImageNet, um, we would probably get the classification for this image saying wolf. Now, there's no actual wolf in this image, but it's a wolfy looking bear, so not as wrong as one might uh, think. 2014, the actual label from the state of the art algorithm at that time, a brown bear is swimming in the water. There's brown bear, there's water, they're not together, but um, certainly um, uh, pretty good. And then in 2017, we're getting to the point where the labels of these images, for this image is two brown bears sitting on top of rocks. Now we just heard from Gary about all of the places where this could fail, and those are undoubtedly true, but this is still a remarkable amount of progress in a very short time frame. Um, what's enabled this, as we all know, is better models, but they really sit on top of these two pieces. One is very, very large amounts of data, so the models that I just talked about require 10 million images, um, and of course, an incredible amount of compute power enabled by the cloud. Um, and because, and we put those two together, what's enabled, what's, what these have enabled is really the ability to create really rich and expressive models, such as the deep learning models, that in the low data regimes are actually un outperformed by simple models like linear regression or random forests, but as the data size grows, they continue to get better and better, whereas the simple models plateau out. Um, I'm going to skip past um, that slide, but um, actually, let me talk about that for a little bit because it, it actually feeds into what we're doing. So we're all familiar with um, this, the deep learning models and how um, it builds up the features uh, hierarchically over time, but I think what's really important, and we'll come into what I talk about later, is that what this actually does is it puts those images in a low dimensional manifold if you look at the internal representation of this network. And that low dimensional manifold captures some fundamental um, semantic aspects of this perceptual input. So when you put those images in this low dimensional manifold, what we see is that two images of trucks that are perceptually quite distinct from each other are sitting next to each other in the manifold, because otherwise you couldn't actually label them correctly both as trucks, um, you'll also find that things that are within related classes, like cars or tractors, are not quite as close, but in the same region of the manifold. And then as you start moving away, you'll see that cats and dogs and turtles are in a different part of the space. And so uncovering this structure, this low dimensional space within this very high dimensional space of images is one of the really critical capabilities that deep learning has enabled. Um, and in many cases, you can really start to disentangle interesting and important meaning from um, this type of, um, of analysis without, uh, to Gary's point, actually understanding what's going on, but in a way that sort of disentangles different semantic layers. So here, for instance, you see the um, input image. This is, a, this is a fairly new paper from uh, late last year that um, is doing what's called image transfer between images of winter scenes, images of summer scenes, there's no actual images in this training regime of the same scene in both winter and summer. It's just given a lot of images of different scenes in winter and different scenes in summer, but is able to then understand the, un the underlying skeleton of the scene from the layer on top of it that corresponds to the changes cor that, um, that arise from the weather. So input images, um, so it's able to then take an image, for instance, on the left of a snowy day and then convert it to a sunny day of the same scene um, without ever being trained on corresponding images. 
So that was a very brief preview of some of the work that's happened in, in machine learning, especially as it relates to perceptual data. And I'm going to sort of detour back to the focus of what we do, which is in the space of biomedicine. So um, machine learning has been applied in interesting ways in biomedicine, starting actually, I'm going to use images again as a running theme here. Um, and the first, one of the first applications that's been compelling in biomedicine that uses images and machine learning was in digital pathology. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do one of the earlier papers in this space. Um, and this was a paper that looked at tumor biopsy images, one of the very first um, um, papers that, that looked at those and do that in a very data-driven way. So we looked at uh, breast cancer images. Um, this is called H&E stained pathology samples. And the goal was to classify five-year survival. And what you see it below is, what, uh, is what's called the Kaplan-Meier curve, which is a survival curve. So the x-axis is time, and then you have the high-risk group and the low-risk group, and the survival, how many patients survive for the high-risk versus the low-risk group. And you see that there is a very clear ability that the algorithm has developed by looking at those images to distinguish the high-risk and the low-risk group. At that point in time, this was back in 2011, this this was, this was making these predictions of five-year survival based on these images better than the average pathologist. So that was very satisfying. But what was even more satisfying to us was that when we gave the machine learning these, um, these images, we didn't, this was pre-deep learning, remember this 2011, but we created hundreds of features that the computer, that people had never really looked at before, weren't part of the standard of care. So this was, at the time, things like, you know, um, how close is a tumor cell to the closest non-tumor, uh, what's called a stromal cell, within the same tissue? Um, and so the average, and, and various other characteristics of the stromal tissue that had never really been looked at before. Turns out that the algorithm was actually using exactly those non-traditional features to make this uh, classification much better than what pathologists had been able to do. So it was by not looking under the lamppost that the computer was able to make those predictions. Now, what's interesting is for those of you who are actually in this space, um, you might be sitting here saying, well, wait a minute, everyone knows that what's called the tumor microenvironment, the environment in which the tumor lives, is really important for cancer prognosis because it reflects the involvement of the immune system in, um, in the cancer and the ability of the immune system to attack the cancer. And today, that's well recognized. But in 2011, no one was talking about the tumor microenvironment as an important factor in cancer. And so effectively, by being unbiased and data-driven, the computer was able to um, discover what was, at that point, one of the earliest harbingers of, um, of the importance of the immune system in um, cancer prognosis, which is, uh, which is why this paper got the amount of um, headline news that it did. Um, so today, there's been a ton of progress um, since our early paper in 2011, and today everyone, of course, is using deep learning for looking at these pathology samples. Um, so this is one recent paper that actually demonstrates not only that the computer is better able to make pr predictions on prognosis than the average pathologist, but actually better able to do that even than an expert pathologist. So on the, X, so on the left side, you see the same Kaplan-Meier curve where the stratification of high risk and low risk was made by an expert pathologist using the standard of care. And on the right side, that same stratification made by a computer, you can see the gap between those lines being considerably higher for the computer than it is for the pathologist. So computers have now, in some sense, exceeded um, human level performance on this task. But to me, one of the more interesting ones, even than that, is the one on the right. This was a very recent paper that came out in 2018, um, where the computer is able to do something that no pathologist has ever really been demonstrated to do reliably, which is to look at the cancer image. And by looking at the cells, say not only what that this is cancer or not, but what is the genetic lesion that actually drove the cancer, what's called the driver mutation? And that is something that no pathologist um, has been, I mean, some pathologists think they can do it and have claimed to do it, but no one's actually really demonstrated that pathologists can do this reliably. So, um, before I dive into what we're doing, though, I want to say that this is a very, um, 
that you want to be very careful when applying machine learning in general, and especially in the context of medical care, uh, because of the enormous susceptibility to confounders and the batch effects that I mentioned briefly on the panel. So this is a very recent paper that I think made this point very eloquently, um, where the idea here, the task here is to look at uh, x-ray images and try and classify from the type of image on the left whether there's a fracture or not in the image. And you, you look at the graph on the right, you say, you know, this is a pretty compelling ROC curve. It's, you know, could be better, but it's pretty convincing. Um, and they matched it for age and gender and so on, and it all looks really great. And then you look at that same low-dimensional manifold that I mentioned earlier, and you see something that is kind of interesting emerge from that. So the bottom half of this graph is the representation of the low-dimensional manifold using a Tishni, uh, where you're overlaying fracture versus non-fracture. And you can see that the fracture and non-fracture is actually quite interspersed um, within the clusters in the Tishni diagram. On the top half, however, you can see the, um, the same TSNI graph, but what's what overlaid is the version of the scanner, the model of the scanner that took the scan. See, beautiful stratification where it completely nails which scanner took the scan. So that immediately makes you suspicious that something weird's going on. And um, sure enough, it turns out that what the deep learning was actually learning is which scanner took the scan. And certain hospitals have a much larger population of fracture patients than other hospitals. So by identifying which scanner, you were identifying which hospital, which gave you incredible cues on whether this was a, a likely fracture patient or not. So when you started correcting, for instance, for various other things, um, like for instance, which hospital took the scan, you get an ROC curve that's effectively a little bit better than random. And so when we talked about the risks of data aggregation and data quality, this is the kind of phenomenon that you have in mind. So um, now I'm going to, in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about what we're, uh, what we're actually doing in the context of all of this um, in our work at Incitro and why we're doing this. So what we're, we're in the business of constructing new therapeutics. And um, there's been a huge set of advances in therapeutics ranging in the last you know, 50 to 80 years from the polio vaccines to the first biologics, which gave us the cancer therapies and the anti-autoimmunity therapies, um, to uh, cystic fibrosis, which is one of, I think, the most incredible uses of the human genome to identify very specific genetic mutations that can then be treated to give cystic fibrosis patients an effectively almost completely normal life. Where, whereas it had been a death sentence up until quite recently, and, um, and so on. So this is the good news in the therapeutic space. The bad news in the therapeutic space is what's come to be called Irum's Law. So for those of us who grew up writing the tidal wave of Moore's Law, Irum's Law is an interesting inversion of that. Um, and what it shows is that on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is the number of drugs approved per billion dollars in R&D spending, in log space. So basically that means that there is a consistent exponential decrease in productivity for pharmaceutical R&D. Um, and the question is, how can, we, um, how can we address that? And now, if you look at the details of this, the cost is not because the cost of any individual molecule is now exponentially larger. In fact, if you look in the 1970s, it cost $100 million to, um, to develop a drug. Now it costs $2.5 billion. It's not because that single molecule is 25 times more expensive. It's because we start out, we need to start out with many, many, many more candidates at the beginning because so many of them fail at different steps along the way. So that single compound that makes it is carrying it on its back um, the cost of tens of thousands of things that didn't. So this is fundamentally a problem of prediction. If we could make better predictions up front on what's likely to work and what's not, we would be in much better shape in terms of the cost curve. So how do we make better predictions? Um, and how do we bring machine learning to bear here? So here is where we really want to bring together um, two sources of big data um, that are each separately useful, but I think when bringing them together, you have incredible power. 
Um, so one of the sources of big data in biomedicine is genetic data, and we heard about this um, from Jeff in the panel just a moment ago, um, where if you look at the number of human genomes sequenced since the very earliest human genome in 2001 um, to today, you see, and again, this is a log scale on the y-axis, that the number of human genomes sequenced is growing not only exponentially, but actually twice as fast as Moore's Law. So depending on if you believe this graph, to con this trend line to continue, the number of human genome sequenced by 2025 will be somewhere between um, 100 million to 2 billion human genomes. So that's a lot of data. That data on its own is interesting. It's even more interesting when you combine it with large amounts of phenotypic data, like from the UK Biobank, where you have an enormous number of phenotypes that align with those genotypes. So you can start making that genotype-phenotype connection. Um, and so you can think about really just doing this gen genotype to phenotype mapping for different types of traits. And sure enough, over the last um, 10 years or so, there's been more and more individual genetic variants that have been tied to more and more different phenotypes that range from um, things like LDL cholesterol to things like educational attainment, Alzheimer's disease, um, and more. So that's a really remarkable um, sort of beginning to give us an understanding of how genetics plays into human traits, but um, it's really difficult to interpret because um, it turns out that um, there are many, many variants that have very small effect sizes. So each one of those variants makes a very small difference. And how do we make sense of that in a way that gives us the starting point for um, getting at therapeutic interventions? So you could say, well, maybe they don't really matter, but it turns out that in aggregate, they really do. So what you see here is what's called a genome-wide polygenic risk score. Um, Jeff referred to that in his comments. Um, and so this is, if you put all these small variants together and you look at the tails of the distribution, the right-hand tail, people who have an accumulated burden of disease, they really do have a very significant um, difference in their phenotypic outcome that often is very similar to having a very highly penetrant genetic variant um, such as for cystic fibrosis. So there's a lot of signal in these data, but it's very difficult to put it together and where you start really needing to have more sophisticated tools um, from perhaps from machine learning. So where can we... How do we tease this apart? How do we really take that um, genetic variance, the genetic data that is so important but so hard to interpret? And what we're doing is we're going to generate large amounts of molecular data that can help us interpret and understand the limited genetic data that we have from humans. And so the idea is, how can we take very high content biological data to really drive that uh, understanding of the genotype-phenotype mapping? So this is where we're going to be able to ride another tidal wave of data generation. Um, in the last few years, there's been this incredible explosion in new technologies that bioengineers have generated that can allow us to create a perfect storm of data production. The first of those is um, better cellular systems. We no longer need to rely on cancer cells that are 50 years old that have been passaged so often that they've lost any similarity to human genetics. Instead, we can take a skin sample from any one of us, a patient or a normal or someone who's not a patient, convert that into a stem cell and then grow it into a neural cell, a cardiomyocyte, a, a liver cell, a hepatocyte that recapitulates within it um, the genetics of that person but in a lineage that, is, that, gives rise, that gives us an understanding of how that manifests in the tissue that is relevant. You can even grow entire little cerebral organoids um, with electrical activity from skin, from skin cells of individual people. So that's on the cellular system side. We can now perturb those systems using CRISPR to modify the genetics to really drive the phenotypes to much more extreme states. And then we can phenotype those cells to really measure, often at single molecule resolution, um, the abundance of different genes or proteins, where they localize in the cell, and so on. So together, this gives us an incredible wealth of data that we can now overlay um, on the genetics to understand the mechanisms of human disease.
And now, of course, with this flood of data, you need an incredible uh, interpretation power of machine learning, and that's where we're building new types of models to interpret the high content data. So what we're building at Incitro is what we call the biodata factory that puts these techniques together with high throughput automation and microfluidics to create data at an unprecedented scale um, that we can then use to drive the development of new therapeutics. Um, so I'm going to skip past this so because we are getting close to time. And I'm just going to end with um, one high level sort of view, so I'm going to take one more minute um, to think about this from a macro scale. Um, if you think about science, science has proceeded in epochs over time, uh, where in certain periods of time, one scientific discipline suddenly makes a huge amount of progress in a relatively short time frame. So back in the late 1800s, this was chemistry, when we moved away from alchemy and trying to move to turn lead into gold and, un and understanding the periodic table. And then in the early 1900s, this was physics, where we understood the connection between um, matter and energy um, and, and time, and really started to create that picture. 1950s was digital computing, where a computer was able to suddenly replicate processes that only people had been able to do up until that point. And then in the 2000s, we had a sudden bifurcation of two fields that made an enormous amount of progress in a short amount of time. One of those is data, um, which emerged directly from computing and the ability to accumulate and utilize very large amounts of data. On the other side, you had what you might think of as quantified biology, because this was the time of that first human genome project and the first microarrays and super-resolution microscopes and all of these that allowed us to measure biology at an unprecedented scale. But these two threads proceeded in parallel with almost no interaction between them up until, I think, where we are today, where I think we're at the beginning of a field that, for want of a better word, I'm going to call biodata engineering, and I hope someone comes up with a better name for it, um, of how, which is a field that puts those two together and allows us to measure biology at an unprecedented scale, use the new analytical techniques to interpret what we're measuring, and then brings that back using technologies like CRISPR to engineer biological systems to do things that they're not naturally uh, doing, whether that is curing um, certain diseases or engineering plants to suck more carbon dioxide out of the, um, out of the air or, um, or creating better biofuels. So how do you now engineer the systems to do something different? I think it's going to be a remarkable field that's enabled by all of these advancements that occurred on both the biology side and on the machine learning side. So this is the time, I think, to be doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, oh. questions. Questions. Okay. <laughs> don't, I, get, I get to answer questions. Yeah, I didn't don't know run that. away, Jess. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of people with lots of questions. Sorry. Um, if I may, just as an Please. opener. Um, so, um, as a non technician, it's very exciting for me to hear about things like this and to try and get my head around some of the incredibly complex work that you're doing. And you did a little bit of speculation at the end there yes. about what this could be used for, and that sounded quite exciting. Could you just say a little bit more about the potentiality of this field? Yeah. So biology, for those of you who haven't played around with it, is unbelievably complicated. I've played around with multiple data sets over the course of my career. Biology is probably the single most complicated thing I've ever done because of the amount of different entities that play a role and how little we understand about even... The, every, we're discovering new entities over you know, on a regular basis in biology. So I think this is an area where we really need to have the ability to measure the system in many, many different ways. And in sometimes without even understanding exactly what's going on, be able to make these predictions of if we see this in the system, that is what it implies about what the phenotype, what is the, um, out, what, what this organism might do, um, whether it be a cell in a human or or um, a cell that's trying to uh, become a bio, to, to, to be a biofuel. And so I think that there is the opportunity here to engineer um, biology to 
make better food for us, um, to make better fuels, uh, to make better drugs. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a wide open field. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Biology is really, really hard, but I think we finally have the tools that provide us that, um, that crack in the door.